look at my generation, we typically have later family formation, we have later home ownership, we don't have a lot of wealth formation. And there's so few people of my generation around my age, born in the 80s, that are having kids and having families. And there's so long that we've waited for this that I think it's really interesting to be a voice out there. And it's really important for me to be a voice out there. So I say, you know, try to say to my uh, my followers on social media, you know, once a day, maybe or a couple times a week, I post up, be a rebel, start a family. Because I think that is kind of almost like an act of rebellion in today's society, because today's society is all about, hey, what's the next movie? What's going on on social media? What's going on here? Look at this. Look at this headline. Look at that headline. Right. But when it comes to kids, it's all about the future. It's all about setting them up for success. It's about developing them as young humans into young adults. Right. I said, I'm not I'm not raising kids. Right. I'm raising adults. What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace. And before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Joining me now, First Class Father, Jack Pisobic. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Hey, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. All right, let's kick it off like this. How many kids do you have? How old are they? I got two kids so far. Uh, for oldest is three, youngest is six months, both boys. Very cool. Did you guys find out what you were having? Did you do any gender reveal or did you guys wait till the end to find out? So, uh, you know, me being, you know, kind of being in the news business and coming from an Intel background, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I don't like surprises. I like being the first to know. So I was like, I want to know as soon as possible. Let's get, you know, I think the genetic test is the one we did that gets it real fast. So we did that for both found out right away though. We didn't do gender reveals because personally, I think gender reveals are getting a little cringe. And, uh, I think it's becoming more about the parents than it is about the actual kids. And so I said, look, you know, we'll, we'll do the baby shower for my wife or, you know, they do the shower was the shower, the first one and the sprinkle. I think I've been informed is like the, you know, after the first one, you do baby sprinkles. So we did that. And then, uh, I think we waited and just when, when they were both born, we just did a nice, you know, first picture of them with us and then did a name reveal and just, just had it all set up like that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, but we have four kids and my oldest is 15. So back then it wasn't a, a thing really, gender reveal, but we found out we had the obstetrician write it down on an envelope. We hung it on our Christmas tree because it was around Christmas time. We went to Christmas midnight mass and then we came home and just my wife and I opened it up to find out what we were having. So well, no, that see, awesome. that I like, right? So a gender reveal between the couple, right? And of course, midnight mass, right? I made it through my own heart right there. Right, um, yeah. That That's something that's very special. Actually, funny enough was... um. When we got our very first one, we had actually the second one we kind of did like that where we set it up with an e with uh, you know an envelope and we just kept it safe. But with the first one, <laughs> we uh, I had asked them. I said, "Hey, don't just you know put this in an email or something. Let let us know before you tell us." And the, and the OB just straight up emailed it to my wife. She said, "Oh yeah, you're having a boy." <laughs> we're like driving yeah. in the car yeah that was the thing my wife wanted to know i didn't so we compromised there i just didn't want to find out in the room with this other woman i was like let's at least make it just between me and you to find out so that, that was how we rolled you yeah know, no that. i like that i like that uh and, and if you could hear jack please just take a minute to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do yeah sure my background um i'm out of the philadelphia area by um uh, by way of where I grew up. So Narstown and then, uh, went to Temple university there in North Philly. Um, after that, uh, lived in China for a couple of years, came back, joined the U S Navy, worked as an Intel officer, uh, did that for eight and a half years, then got into kind of the news business, um, was at one American news doing the TV side. And now I just took a new position as the senior editor of human events, uh, magazine. We're kind of, kind of restarting human events. They were, they've been around since 1944. Uh, Ronald Reagan used to read it back in the day. And, um, you know, it had kind of, kind of been on a pause, but myself and a group of other people have decided that it's time to, time to resurrect that storied organization. So we're, you know, we're putting that together, building it back up. And I think it's going to be really great. And so, for, and for some reason, they think it's a good idea to have me, uh, as the senior editor. So, so we'll see, we'll see, but I've been doing that for a couple of weeks now. It's been a lot of fun. And I just, uh, just dropped a new book about, um, all 
about this group Antifa, but it's really, you know, really kind of get into political violence and the fact that, you know, we're starting to see that more in the United States and how much of a danger that is that, you know, regardless of what side you're on, you know, you don't want to go down that path. You don't want to open the things up where people are being violent. People are using, you know, their fists. People are using, um, you know, any kind of physical activity when you should just be having an argument over your opinions and over your policies and all your values. And you should be talking that out. That's how we usually do things in America, right? We don't go to the streets with this stuff, but increasingly that's happening more and more in the United States. And so that's what this book is really about. Yeah, I'm going to touch more on the book in just a minute here, Jack, but uh, let, let me bring it back to you then here. Um, and obviously, listen, you crush it on Twitter. You got all these inside the inside skinny on all the scoops. It seems like you got you may change that tag to Nostradamus or something like that. because Nostradamus, maybe. Yeah, something like that. But uh, take me back here then. Three years you're into this. Uh, how, how old were you then when you first became a father and how did becoming a dad change your perspective on life? Yeah, so I was uh, I was 33 and um, a little bit later than I wanted to get started, but you know, sometimes life is the way it is. And I got to tell you that ha- becoming a father for me, it was, it was almost like you got so much more skin in the game now, right? You know, sure, I've I've had a house before, I've had a wife, you know, I'd had a dog growing up, but it's it's one thing to say, hey, okay, you know, I'm working this job and I've got these these bills, etc. But this is totally different, right? This is a living, breathing human being who is responsible, right? I'm responsible, I should say. My responsibility is not only to take care of them, but to um, but to raise them, to develop them, to form them as a human, and especially as a father of boys, right? It is our job to prepare them to confront the outside world. And, you know, I can remember sitting in the, uh, in the hospital and my wife, I guess she was, she was in the bathroom or something, and He's sitting there and he's he's all packed up and it's time to go home and they've got him, you know, kind of on the cart and we've got all this stuff. We've got the baby bag. I've got the car seat in the car, you know, following all the rules, getting ready to go. And the nurse is in there and she says, well, here he is. And I'm like, great. So, so you know, what, what do I do now? She says, well, you take him home <laughs> and you raise him. And I said, OK. And uh, how long does that take? She says, usually about 18 years if you're doing it right, you know. And it's it's it blew my mind that, you know, we live in a society where there's so many rules. You know, if you want to drive a car, you got to go through all these tests. You want to get insurance, you know, you have to apply for it, et cetera. If you're alone, you got to go through all these hoops. But, you know, when it comes to creating human life and becoming responsible for another human life, I mean, it's that's it. You know, you do it. You have the birth. It's done. You go home. Boom. And the lack of oversight is definitely different than the way that, you know, we have these sort of governments and institutions that are kind of looking over our shoulder for so many of these other things. But here you got something where, and, you know, it's, it, it's truly on the parents, it's on the father, it's on the mother. And of course the grandparents are involved in the wider family. And we really believe in that. We've got our grandparents very involved in our family. It's, it was really interesting to me to see that this is something where not only is there a lack of oversight, which is good in many respects, actually, because it allows you to raise your kids as you see fit. And I think that's the the duty, certainly, of every father. But it's also a right of all parents to raise their kids as they see fit. But at the same time, you got to understand that, hey, this is on you, right? This is something that you've got to take up. This is the mantle. You know, <laughs> you're the one that got yourself into this situation. There ain't anybody else that's going to come save you. This is all up to you from here on out. And it's day in, day out. It's a 24 7 obligation. It's not something that you can ever shirk. And, you know, realizing that, you know, it, and certainly as someone who, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of in that like older millennial category. I consider myself like a centennial where that kind of cusp between Gen Z and the younger millennials. And you look at my generation, we typically have later family formation. We have later home ownership. We don't have a lot of wealth formation. And there's so few people of my generation around my age, born in the 80s, that are having kids and having families. And there's so long that we've waited for this that I think it's really interesting to be a voice out there. And it's really important for me to be a voice out there. So I say, you know, try to say to my uh, my followers on social media, you know, once a day, maybe or a couple times a week, a post up, be a rebel, start a family. 
Because I think that is kind of almost like an act of rebellion in today's society. Because today's society is all about, hey, what's the next movie? What's going on on social media? What's going on here? Look at this. Look at this headline. Look at that headline. You know, you're just constantly in a state of ever-present, you know, current moment as opposed to actually looking forward or thinking about what you can do in terms of formation, right? But when it comes to kids, it's all about the future. It's all about setting them up for success. It's about developing them as young humans into young adults, right? I said, I'm not, I'm not raising kids, right? I'm raising adults. I'm raising people. I want to have fully formed people. And so, you know, that's, that's something that I think about a lot. It's something I do when I do reading in terms of fatherhood and parenthood. And uh, quite frankly, it's actually made me something, you know, kind of think more about myself because your your kids are like little mirrors at the same time, right? Because they're mirroring everything you do, especially, you know, when he hits the toddler age, he's three now. So it's, I mean, he can, he's looking at dad and everything dad does, he wants to do. He wants to repeat what I do. He wants to follow what I do. And so then that makes me check myself. I said, well, where did he pick up that behavior? Where did he pick up that uh, turn of phrase, right? Well, he picked that up from watching you. So it really makes you kind of think ahead just a little bit before you do something. They say, what are you doing? And how do kids understand things? Well, they perceive things. They understand money. When the collection plate's going around or the basket's going around at church, and I say, here's you know, here's a $10 bill, here's a $20 bill, put it in the basket. He doesn't know what that is. He doesn't know. He just says, dad says, put this green piece of paper in the basket. And he said, well, dad likes it, so I do it, right? But it's the idea of, to him, is that time and attention are how they measure value at that age. So if you're giving them the attention, if you're forming that relationship, if you spend an hour with them uh, every night before they go to bed, reading books, you know, we try to, <laughs> we always read books. We try to read them in like funny voices is something I do. And uh, he'll say, read it, read it happy. And then I get all happy. And he said, read it angry. And then rah, rah, the dinosaurs went into sleep all at the same time and they kept snoring, read it sad. And then we switch it around and we're laughing so hard every night. But it's, those times where I'm forming that relationship now because I want to have that conversational, easy relationship from the youngest age so that when he gets older, when he starts burgeoning out into the world, when he starts encountering things, when it comes to his adolescence, when it comes to high school, et cetera, right? I don't want to get it to be you know, sort of that interrogation scenario where the only time I talk to him is when we're sitting at the dinner table and said, well, you know, with the, like the light bulb over the head, what did you do today? What did you learn today? I said, no, no. It's like, having that relationship, having that conversational, casual relationship where, yes, as a father, you know, it's my role to guide him, but also we have that emotional core that we can go back to that he knows, hey, you know, we're on the same side. I want you to succeed. I want only the best for you. We're going, we go places every weekend, et cetera. But it's having those quiet moments where you can even, you know, the same way you would have with any real relationship, but making sure that you have that with your kids. And look, I get it. In modern society, there's so many distractions. There's there's this flashing light and that flashing light. Turn that stuff off. Spend time with your kids. This is the only time you can make that investment. And it will pay off dividends because I guarantee you the other stuff and the rest of the world will take care of itself, right? Your kids, you take care of. Yeah, really great stuff, Jack. And I, I love when you tweet that out, be a rebel, start a family. One of the reasons I started the podcast when I did it, I drive a lot of Uber and on the weekends, um, I would hear from a lot of the young men, like when I told them I had four kids, they would look at me like I had four heads. You know, they thought that was like crazy to them. They could never, uh, they always had expressed that fatherhood was something that they were putting off in life, not something that they wanted to uh, you know, right. embrace early on. So, uh, and I think we have too many of these negative stigmas too, where it's like, oh, the ball and chain. And we see, you know, we have the bachelor party. And it's all your last moment of freedom before, you know, you get into this horrible life. And I, I think that that all needs to change as well, because uh, really when I bring on all these guys that have really just really crushed it in life. They say, you know what, despite all these accomplishments I've had, it's really been through the experience of becoming a father that's given me any sense of real fulfillment in life. So that's the message I try to, you know, really hone in on here from bringing on a lot of these guys that have done all these things we think are going to be great, winning Super Bowls or whatever it may be, you know, multi-million dollar entrepreneurs. But it's really uh, at the core of it, it, it's our families that really matter the most. And I, I think right now we got a fatherless problem 
going on in our country. We have so many kids are growing up without a father, yeah. without a father figure in their life. And I think it's the number one social issue we got. We're trying to solve all these other social issues. Uh, but unless we really strengthen our family units, I think we're going to be running around in circles here. And uh, I think if we bring a little God back into focus, uh, I, I think that would help as well. And I think it would get rid of probably 90 percent of the problems we're having in our country. Well, I think you're right. And it's so important to put that out because this is the week of Father's Day that's coming up. You know, I know I got my dad. I'm not going to say it now because he might listen to this, but I got him something nice. I can't wait to give him. You know, I had a great dad. His father was a World War II vet. He actually passed away when my dad was pretty young. Um, so my dad, a lot of a lot of his fatherhood that he was he was winging it right with us. He was he, you know, he was winging it in terms of being a dad because he didn't always have that growing up. But he did such a fantastic job working day in, day out for us, spending time with us, taking us to the baseball field. You know, uh, even, you know, the game's not on. He sit there. Hey, let's get a basket of balls. I'll pitch. You guys hit. Then we'll switch. I'll teach you guys how to hit, how to throw, how to catch. And it's not about, you know, you don't realize it at the time. It's not about learning to play baseball. All right. It's about understanding discipline, understanding that hard work is what leads to achievement. It's understanding that you got to buckle down and you have to grow and you have to go through pain. And so, especially as men, you have to go through pain. You have to go through suffering. You have to go through failure. You're not always going to win. That's okay. You're not going to hit every ball. Sometimes you're going to strike out. Sometimes it's going to suck. Sometimes you're going to be in front of everybody running out one of those little league games. But you know what? You pick yourself up. You keep going. That's so much part of manhood. That's so much part of fatherhood. That's what my dad taught me growing up. And I will always, always cherish those moments and, the, and really just great memories, you know, riding the bike to the baseball field with my dad. And now when I look at my son, but I also look at some of the other guys out there our age, I say, guys, this, there's so much opportunity in this country right now. There's so many things you can do. There's so many avenues to success. The world's literally at your fingertips. Right. But what do we do? We just want to sit and scroll. We want to Netflix and chill. We want to order some Uber Eats, sit at home. Say, oh, the government says you got to sit at home. You can't do nothing. I say, well, are you really develop developing as a person if you're doing that? And this is something where you mentioned God. There's actually a writing by Thomas Aquinas, the great saint and the great philosopher Thomas Aquinas. And one thing that he wrote is that the fullness of development of a person, right? is through full actualization of our potential. And I've, I've been, I read that recently and I was thinking about it a lot. And so when you're born, the idea is that you've gotten, this is Jesus talks about this, a parable of the talents, right? You know, everyone's given certain talents. Like not everyone's going to be a world champion, uh, you know, kickboxer, UFC fighter, baseball, whatever it is, right? No, not everyone's going to be, but you're going to have some talents and maybe, you know, maybe you're someone who can put a couple of different talents together and then boom, you become very marketable, very successful. It's called talent stacking. You know, you can be good in a variety of different fields, but then you average that together, ton of success come your way, right? So Aquinas gives, this is the Bible. This is Thomas Aquinas talking about. It. He's saying that God has given you those talents for a reason. He's given you that potential, but you are not fully developed as a human until you've reached your full potential. And as men, fatherhood is part of that. Now, I get that it's not for all men, 100%. And certain things happen. I'm not talking about that. And my heart goes out to people like that, medical issues, etc. But when I'm in a general broad sense, that if you're deciding not to have kids, you're not going to fully realize yourself, your moral development, your spiritual development, your biological development, so much of that comes through being a father. And you'll learn things about yourself that you never thought possible. And I'll tell you one thing, and you know, I know there's the fatherhood podcast, but you know, some things that I learned about my wife is that there is nothing, there is nothing stronger than a mother, right? That you think, you think, man, you know, man, we're physically strong. I have seen her with no sleep for weeks and the, a crying baby who's up all night and she will still roll out of bed and she'll take care of him. She'll change the diaper. She'll feed him. She'll do everything. Even, even if she's not even, she's not even complete away. She can't even tell what time of day it is. Right. But my wife would do that. And that's the power. And I would never have known that she had that. I would have never have been as close to her had we not gone through all of that together in our relationship. And so becoming a father and becoming a parent has even made us closer. And yeah, don't get me wrong. There's been, you know, there's been stress. There's been friction. Of course, kids add all that stuff, but that's life, right? And if you are hiding from that stuff because you think, oh, I can't make it, or you think that I'm going to be a failure, or you think that, you know, I can't do this. I can't learn this. Look, you are only shortchanging yourself. 
because I'm telling you, this is the greatest ride in life. It's got its ups and downs like any other ride, but I guarantee you, kids are one of those things where it's like when you're doing it day to day, you're like, oh man, this is a lot of work, but you put them to bed, you sit down and you think, God, I love having kids. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll tell you what too. It's uh, one of the things I'll hear a lot of the excuses will be, "Hey, it's it's too expensive. Kids cost too much money." And a lot of times I'll tell them, "Listen, if you think kids cost too much money, wait till you you talk to somebody that's 60, 65 years old that never had any kids. You know, you find out that that costs a lot more later on down the line. You know, so it, it's definitely something that you want to experience in life. It's definitely a big part of it. And I, one of the things about just going back to the father's thing, I'm curious to ask you about because I know you just put the Antifa book out there. These kids that are involved in this Antifa, we've just seen all obviously all the riots that took place, uh, you know, burning down buildings, destruction of property, even guys that would smash windows at the Capitol. Uh, it, it, if you are growing up with a father influence in your life, I don't think you end up in those situations did you find when doing this research with antifa are a lot of these antifa kids are a lot of them coming from fatherless households did you find any correlation between that well it's either fatherlessness or father absenteeism right you know dad's always at work dad's a workaholic typically your your average antifa member is going to be someone who's actually quite uh quite well off or from a family that's quite well off these are not you know, your working class kids, your working class families at all in terms of what we've seen in the data. And in fact, many of these uh, Antifa members still live at home with their parents. However, you can see a direct correlation between having positive relationships with the fathers and the members of Antifa, particularly the ones that commit violence. And, you know, studies have been done on this. Even, even Eric Hoffer, who was writing in the 1950s, was talking about this in terms of true believers. And he was writing about how people who don't go through that childhood where they're taught the value of hard work, where they're taught to have a rite of passage as you're going from, uh, you know, your childhood into adolescence, into adulthood. That's the natural progression. That's our biological. That's our spiritual progression, our mental progression. Yet if you don't go through that, right, you you enter into this sort of area and you look at how widespread this is now of perpetual adolescence where you're not coming into adulthood and we see this in you know I, I when i see guys in their 30s their mid 30s who are just every friday going out drinking every saturday going out drinking with the boys drink with the boys make some money during the week i'm going to go out and say what do you do you're in your 30s man you're in your 30s like what do you what do you what are you setting yourself up for and i'll tell you you can look at you know you mentioned um talking about your 60s if you go through and you actually look at some of these there was a um there was a study that was done a couple of years ago and it was about it was by a nursing home uh psychologist and they were talking about deathbed conversations right i know a little bit morbid but hear me out and they were saying the common the five most common things that you would hear on deathbed converse uh deathbed conversations you know what wasn't on that list going out drinking with the friends Spend, nobody says they want to spend more time at work, spend more time at the office, right? What does everybody say? They say, you know what? I wish I spent more time with my family or I wish I had more kids or man, I wish I had had kids at all. That Those are in the top five things people say. So we know that now. We have the benefit of now. We can look at this study and we say, wow, this is what people are saying where there's, was their regrets. So if that was their regret in the future and I'm here, I'm in my 20s or I'm in my 30s and I have the possibility, look, we're Sorry, guys, you know, I hate, hate to be the one to be the bearer of bad news on this, but we're, we're all going to get there. Father time is coming for all of us. Right. He's going to win in the end every single time. Right. And you, you are going to go and you're going to be judged and you're going to meet God and you're going to have to get to that position. So the question is, what are you going to do from now to then before you can get there to set yourself up for the best situation possible? And for me, that's part that's always been part of having kids. You know, I never. I never for a moment in my life didn't want kids, um, even from a young age, even from when I was in high school, et cetera. I, I just couldn't wait to be a dad. Absolutely couldn't wait. But I always said, and I say this to guys too, they said, if you're out there, you're single, you're still dating, don't date a girl, just get, oh, look, oh man, she's like, she's like a nine, she's like a 10, you know, that's what we always hear. But we never tell guys, hey, look for someone who has the qualities of the person you want to be the mother of your kids. No, we don't tell guys, say, hey, 
what happens you know how, how does this person treat an uber driver how does this person treat a waiter how does this person treat someone who's you know in a, in a service capacity when they're when they're interacting with them you know why because that tells you a lot more about the person than just the way they look than just the way that you know the stuff they post on instagram or whatever right you got to know who the person is that you're getting involved with and you need to take that entire picture together because i guarantee you when you have a situation where you're dating someone, you get involved with someone for that, then you get married, you say, oh, I love him until I'm head over heels, I'm going, I'm in love, right? Then you get to that point, guess what? You're going to have friction, you're going to have division, you're going to have uh, dissension. And kids, they are the absolute best radars when it comes to this stuff. They are emotional sponges. They can sense every little thing that's going on, every little twitch, every little uh, you know, the tone of your voice, all this stuff. They can sense all of that. So you want to set yourself up for success. You want to think, what's my goal? And work backwards from there. So build yourself a system, right? A goal is I want to have kids. Okay, great. I want to have kids. Or I want to have a great relationship. Or I want to have a great wife. Or I want to you know, make six figures. You hear that a lot. I, I, I want to make six figures, right? Well, what's your system? Right? What are you doing on a day-to-day basis to set yourself up for success? When you And then when you're at the point where you already have kids, you say, great, well, I want my kids to do well in life. Sure, who doesn't, right? <laughs> there are kids. But what's your system? What are you doing on a day-to-day basis? Are you just sitting there saying, gosh, I, I hope they turn out all right. You know, we'll see. Roll the dice. No, you got to be in there on a daily basis, spending time with your kids, being with your kids. You know, it's not always going to go well. You know, we're we're in a, we're in potty training phase right now, and he's he's got number one down pretty good, but sometimes number two, I don't know. He's got there's going to be accidents. What can I say, right? You're going to be scrubbing some, you're going to be scrubbing some underwear. So that's that's part of it, guys. That's part of life. That's part of learning. And when he has one of those accidents, I say, okay, you had an accident. All right, we're going to clean this up together. We're not, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to snap at you. I do believe in peaceful parenting and understanding that and meeting their emotions and not setting standards that are too high or too implacable, right? But, you know, you correct the behavior. You call out the mistake, right? He's not quite old enough for, like, obedience, discipline, that kind of stuff, those, those types of sorts of training yet. But it's it's I'm not going to scream at him. I'm not going to lose my mind. No, it's it's praise. It's adulation. So we, we always do a – when he gets it right, when he does one, um, that's, that's totally right. We always do, we actually do a parade. We, uh, we do, I call it like the little, we do, um, it's like the, you remember the old Mickey Mouse Club parade, you know, M I C K. So we'll do that and we'll march all around the house and whoever's in the house better come on in because it's parade time. And we're all going for that parade because I want everyone to know how proud I am that he was able to achieve that accomplishment. And I tell you what, he's gotten to the point now we'll be at the park he will go all by himself, walk over the bathroom, go in there, take care of business, come out, including washing his hands all by himself, right? And he does that. And I didn't do that through screaming. I didn't through yelling. I did through Mickey Mouse parade. So, folks, it can be done. And it's it's there's nothing that will make you even more proud when you realize the type of personality that they have that's coming out when you see them going through these. And, you know, they say like, oh, Jack, you got – you know, you got so many Twitter followers and you're, you're doing this and you have an interview and you're on this trip, whatever. You say, how proud of that? I said, nah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my son <laughs> being able to do that. Right. Because, because I realize that that's a part of myself that's going to go on after me. That's going to be my legacy. And we're tied spiritually. We're tied emotionally. We're tied biologically. And there's, there's something that you get out of that. There's something that you get out of those moments or just, you know, just sitting there, just sitting last night and we were, um, you know, we were reading some, uh, some, I'm actually, I haven't really announced this yet, but I'm actually working on a children's book. Uh, it's going to be part of like a children's book series that's coming out. It's called Brave Books. And I got the artwork in for, um, uh, for the one I'm working on. So it's kind of like a draft and I sat down and read it with him. And that was the, he was the first kid or even person that I showed it to, um, other than, you know, other than the people that are working on it. And, you know, we're, we're sitting there we're reading through the book and he just puts his head on my shoulder and he said, he said, keep, you know, he said, read the story, Dada. And that I, I, you know, you could take all my social media, you could take everything else away that I, I would trade it all for that. That's that's worth, you know, 10 times more than anything else that I've ever accomplished in life.
Very cool. Yeah. Is it going to be a children's book like zero to five or is it going to be like mid pack? I had, I had Jocko Willick on here before. I love his way of the warrior kids series that he's guys are going to be more like that. Or is it going to be more infant to three type uh, children's book? Um, it's actually going to be probably like, probably like five and older. I mean, the artwork is going to be enough where, you know, a younger kid would kind of understand, Hey, there's some stuff going on with foxes and wolves and, you know, the wolves are trying to get the other animals, et cetera. But, you know, really it's, a, it's actually a story about kind of trust and understanding when people come to you for, for certain things. And, um, we get, you know, we kind of get into my, my wife was born in the, uh, in the Soviet union. So the wolves are kind of a stand in for like, uh, you know, the, like the Bolsheviks and there's sort of like a Berlin wall kind of situation that goes on. I say, Hey, things are going to be great. Be great. Just come with us, come with us. And they, you know, they go over to where the, you know, the wolves are living and then they get trapped behind this wall and everything's bad. And they say, well, I don't understand. You, you said everything was going to be great. They said, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know we said that, but um, here's the deal. Uh, you better show up to work or you're going to be in trouble and you're going to be up here on trial. And it, there's there's all this stuff that goes on. And uh, I haven't even worked out the full package yet, but it's sort of like me and a bunch of other influencers. And I think I um, uh, can't we don't have all the people locked down, so I don't want to announce anything. But it's going to be some some pretty big names when people see everyone that's coming in. So it's like a set of 12 that that'll be out and you can get like a subscription sort of deal. Sorry, I didn't mean to turn that into it. Yeah, well, listen, I, I look forward to seeing that. And I love how you say you do the thing with the Mickey Mouse marching. I wouldn't suggest doing that at Penn Station if he's got to go to the bathroom, too. That may not be a good place <laughs> to go marching him into the bathroom. But do you have any other? I, I know you always talk about your Polish um, uh, side on Twitter there. I see my wife's Polish. We do the um, we sing Stolat to the kids on their birthdays. We do oh, the- yeah. Yeah, yeah, we sing so a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah we, we do the Opatki. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying it right on Easter time where we break a piece of the bread, pass it around the table. Each person says something that they're thankful for. Do you have any other do you have any kind of like Polish traditions, any other kind of family traditions that you guys oh, do? I mean, you know, with my wife being from Eastern Europe, I mean, we're eating we're eating Polish food like crazy in the house. We're having pierogies. We have uh, Golopsi, Golomki pretty much pretty much at least once or twice a week, you know, so a steady diet of real Polish food, pierogies, guamki, kabasi. And then, you know, one thing that we do, you know, um, you know, I do want to introduce him to religion at a pretty early age and kind of emphasize the importance of that. So we do go to mass every week. Um, every morning we start out, we do the rosary together. Um, sometimes it's just me and him. Sometimes it's with mom and the brother there as well. And uh, I say it to him because, you know, again, right, that's that's something where he knows that dad is giving this attention and intention equals value, right? That's the key for little kids, that attention equals value and really all the way up. Um, and so we do that. I've taught him so he can do the Hail Mary. He can do the Our Father all the way through just turn three. And uh, we're starting to work on Latin as well. So I want to teach him in English. Now I want to do the Latin as well. Very cool. Yeah. I, l- let me ask you this, Jack, because I'm, I'm always, you know, talking about it. Like I say, years ago, we used to have, I'm one of seven. My father was one of um, six. My mom was one of eight. Like back in the day, there were families that were huge families. They lived in smaller places. Today, everyone has smaller families. They live in larger places. Yeah. A- a- and I think that our, just, just our family units, our nuclear family units have got to get stronger in this country. How do we do it? Like what, what is the, what is the roadmap to strengthening the family units in this country? Because I think if we do that, we're going to have so many less issues that we're seeing. But it, I, I talk some, sometimes about how the father being portrayed in movies and, and shows, which has gotten better. Uh, but it's definitely always shows the father. We were used to seeing him as a, the, the single guy living it up, sleeping with multiple women. He's right. always having a lot of fun. And the single guy, he's, he's always the butt of the joke. He's got his head down. He's never getting laid. He's never having any fun. Uh, so I think that's a part of it. But but how do, how do we get it? How do, how do we you know strengthen so, this and make this so a family first thing? The one part of it thing? is kind of like – in modern society, we're told that to be a man is what's, you know, is what it's, you have your man cave, right? Men are not meant to be leaders, right? Men are simply there to help have the kids to go work, earn some money. And, but then you retreat to your man cave, drink some beer, eat some bacon, watch sports. That's it. That's the only thing you're allowed to do is be a man, but that's not true, right? That's not accurate. And that's not historical. It's not even traditional, right? The traditional male role is that you're the protector. You are the guide for the family, you know? So, so mom, she's running the house. She's running the family. She's in charge of all that. Dad's out there. He's protector. He's the hunter. He's the gatherer, et cetera, right? That's, that's the traditional role. And so for men, that also means at times being the authority figure, being that last voice when it comes to those things, being the one that's setting the direction of things. 
and really stepping up and deciding not just to, you know, okay, we're not going to just lead the family on a vacation. We're going to lead the family on a regular basis. What are we doing? Where are we going as a family? And that's something where men as well, that, you know, it doesn't just mean, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to get all big and I'm look how many muscles I have. No, no, that's not it. That being said, you should go to the gym and you should be working out, right? They'll say, what, what's the thing? Men, men will literally sit and do deadlifts instead of going to therapy. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, squats and deadlifts all day long. But it's and I'm, I, funny story. I, I'm, I'm in the D.C. area. I went out suit, um, suit shopping the other day with my wife. We're trying to find, you know, kind of an, I'm, I was shooting the show down in Nashville with, uh, with Candace Owens and I wanted, wanted like a nice suit. So we go in, every single suit is thin, was the, the slim cut, right? It's all slim cut suits, every little thing with like the skinny jeans type of suit where it's like, it's like skin tight on me. I'm like, I, I, I can't fit in any of these suits, man. The guy's like, are you sure? I'm like, you gotta go, you gotta go bigger. You gotta go bigger. You gotta go bigger. They didn't even have any suits available that were not slim cut in this store i kid you not and it was the next one was the exact same and so this now obviously dc is kind of a bubble but you know i do think that's sort of part of it is that we're it is, is that men we're not focusing on ourselves a, as well right we think okay well as long as i'm you know doing those stuff the tv says i'm allowed to do then i'm being mad. no what are you reading what are you learning what are you, what skills are you learning that you can pass on to your kids and you can teach them, right? Are you, are you getting, it doesn't just mean, Hey, did you do your homework? It's like, take, take 30 minutes, take 30 minutes and sit there and, and be the person who's involved and say, yeah, well, what are you working on? Oh, you're doing some of this. You're doing a little of that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Let me help you out with that a little bit. You have any questions? Okay. I can do it. Right. And so we need to get to the point as well where we're not playing this game of like men versus women, the way media wants to portray it these days it's not men versus women why is it when did it become men versus women right whereas everything you can do i can do better well who said you could like nobody's stopping you at all no no man like no one i know is saying like hey don't get a job don't do this etc right it's it's not like that but instead of pitting people against each other you got to come to a position where it's like you know what? And, I, and by the way, I do think I see this starting to happen with some of the younger millennials even and Zoomers, Gen Z, where they're getting a, they realize that there's been this emphasis on sort of the gender wars. Right. You know, the warfare of the new feminists. And, you know, then you see they have like the manosphere that's out there as well. And it's like, yeah, this isn't working. Right? This is clearly not working. We don't like this. We don't want this. And we want to get back to just sort of more traditional roles. And I, I always joke, I say, the only place you can go anywhere in media today to find just like a traditional romantic comedy, right? Remember the romantic comedies, the great romantic comedies that would come out of Hollywood, you'd have like 10 a year. They don't make them anymore. They're not, think about it, right? When's the last time you saw like a regular romantic comedy, guy meets girl, things get messed up, they break up, they come back together at the end, boom. That's like the same formula. They don't do them anymore. Only place you can find them is Hallmark, the Hallmark Channel. That's like the last stand of just a traditional relationship between men and women. And so that's why one thing that I've been doing, and I'm, I've even said it publicly, like, and there's this this like um, stigma. It's like, oh, you, every Hallmark movie is the same. Well, kind of in the same way that like every romantic comedy is the same and every comedy is the same, right? But I'll go out there publicly and so I'm a Hallmark fan. I like those movies. I know how it's going to end. Doesn't matter because I don't want to fill my head and my family with that kind of crap that's divisive, that's dividing us, that's keeping us at each other's necks. All right, I want something that is positive, that's going to portray things positively. And you know what? Hollywood, if you're listening, right, we're sick of it. We're checking out. We don't want it anymore. Yeah, uh, very well said, Jack. Listen, I'm a big reader myself, and I encourage that with my kids. I try to read at least a book every week. And I think just like if if you're a guy that wants to build your body up and your muscles up, you watch what you eat, you watch what you drink, yep. you watch what you put into your body. You got to do the same for your mind. So uh, I'm a big, you know, a big believer in that as well. Um, so listen, uh, obviously you got the book out right now, Antifa. What other kind of goals or plans are you working on here for yourself for the future? Uh, you know, the next goal is uh, really just kind of getting through the next couple of weeks. I got a million, you know, a million different events the next couple of weeks. But um, funny enough is 
near term so get, getting this human events we want to get from a career side it's getting human events up and running getting to the point where we're able to be breaking stories being ahead of the news um getting you know getting a those stories that sort of you know what's the the cliche the mainstream media is not covering this stuff but also also if for me one thing in the back of my head that's more kind of more of an a not short term but near term priority say two to three years out is i i want to get out of dc right this this whole area i don't want my kids to be raised here that's it's just it's not conducive it's not a great spot there's there's so much moral decay here there's so much um division there's so much chaos it's it's not a good place for kids look i came down for a job i've been here uh nine years now because so i originally came down with the military and then moved over to the media side for political media but you know we want to get out so that's that's actually kind of my next thing so um as I've, i'm doing this book tour for you know for the antifa book but as we're going around i'm thinking what about this place what about <laughs> this place you know and kind of talking to people and so we just did nashville for the first time last week and you know i said my wife was super into it i'm she loves country she's from the soviet union came here 15 years she loves country go figure but she's just total country girl so she loved it she thought it was amazing and so i was i, I don't know if i was that up on it but i liked it you know i liked it we're also you know we're looking at florida we're looking at dallas uh dallas area as well texas but really when it comes down to it it's i want that community right i want them to be set up for success obviously there's going to be temptations in life you know it's kind of like you know one book that i recommend everybody read is uh screw tape letters by c.s lewis and even if you're someone that's not necessarily a believer that book it kind of it's it's a really interesting moral framework because it's and it's cool the way it's set up it's like every person is assigned it's fiction right but it's every person is assigned a demon from the moment they're born and that demon's job is to pull you away from success and to pull you away from that the track that is meant for you to pull you away from your destiny to pull you away from the things that you are you know as i said before achieving your full potential and so this this book because it's fictional it's written from the perspective of the demon and he's got this client you know this case and he's it's 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 really you know it's funny but it's also interesting to think about that you know do you have that little voice in your ear that says yeah you know what just just go watch tv for a couple of hours nobody will care you know whatever go eat eat that bag of chips nobody's looking don't worry about it don't you don't need you, you went to church last week. You don't need to go again. Who's who's really going to know? They don't even do the envelopes anymore, whatever. And so it's it's all of these little things going on on a daily basis. You know, that's uh, that there's that old phrase about, you know, we when we're young, we learn about the war versus good and evil that takes place sort of in the spiritual world or you look at Star Wars, it's good and evil. But in real life, on a day to day basis, good and evil, that's that's in here. Right. That's in your inside your heart and inside your spirit every day and say and it's, you know, which which one am I going to go on? Which decision am I going to take and which step on what path am I going to go on? And so that's what screw tape letters really gets into. It's a great, and it's a short read. It's, it's, it's super short. It's like a hundred pages. Um, but it's a great mental framework to think about life. And so, you know, when I'm looking at understanding that there will be temptations and there will be the wider world for my kids, that being said, I want them to grow up in a community that's at least as close too ideal as possible, where they're going to be around people that have similar values, where they're going to be around people, around parents and other families that have uh, strong values, strong family values, and that you can be in a place where, you know, obviously where it's safe, where people can go out. You know, we, you know, I don't even know what point it was, I guess like mid 90s, late 90s, where, you know, it used to be come out when the street, come home when the street lights come on. You remember that? Come home when the street lights come on. That's you. You're outside to play until the street lights come on. And then where were you? Well, you knew everybody who was on your block. So if you weren't in your yard, or you weren't in front of your house, then you know that, uh, you know, that this neighbor's watching this neighbor. I still remember all the names, Mr. Walper, uh, and Kate, Mr. Strack, like all the people on my, on my block growing up, but it's not like that anymore. So those are the types of communities that I'm looking for, even, you know, not, not necessarily everyone has to be the same religion or political party, whatever. That's not what I'm talking about is I want a community that feels like a community, right? I want a neighborhood that feels like a neighborhood. And I think personally that that's something that I can do for my kids and for my family that uh, that will really set them up for success. 
Yeah, and when you find that neighborhood, don't keep it a secret, all right? Let the oh, rest no, know I'm where it is. Oh, no, I'm a complete secret. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't hey, telling you. Hey, listen, I'm just curious to ask you this, Jack, because, I mean, obviously, you're very popular on social media. Whenever I've had guys on the show, I've had Eric uh, Trump on the show and Secretary Pompeo, and whenever yeah, I have yeah. these guys on, I just get hammered on social media. I know you deal with a lot of this as well. Does it ever get to the point where you feel like your family is in danger, or do you ever feel like, I know some of these people are over the top with some of the stuff they say on social media. I know a lot of it's probably bot accounts, but do you ever get to the position where you're like, well, well wait, maybe, maybe I should slow down on this, or, or do you feel like it's getting threatening? Well, you know, uh, one thing that they say in, um, and I've, you know, I've been through FBI trainings on stuff like this, and they, they typically say that when, when people are shooting their mouths off, they're just shooting their mouths off. You, so the people you really want to worry about are the ones that aren't shooting their mouths off yet. They're bearing that grudge that they're willing to take things to the next level. So, you know, we do take steps to physically protect ourselves, you know, in terms of, um, just in terms of how we own, uh, we own our home in terms of how we, uh, structure our things legally. So, you know, you, you know, protect ourselves from an operational security standpoint. Um, you know, we obviously don't post any pictures of where we live, that kind of thing, but also like, you got to figure if you pull, if you pick up one of those stalkers, you know, I, I always say, honestly, I always say that, yes, you know, Antifa, and here I am writing this whole, whole book about them and, you know, have this altercation where I'm, I'm, steps away inches away from this guy who's trying to you know come come after me trying to get me to start a fight and knowing that my kids are going to watch that someday and say dad how did you handle yourself so i've got them their little eyes in the back of my head but also knowing that you know the people i'm i'm actually most worried so i'm worried about antifa and those guys but i'm actually most worried about like a mark david chapman you know mark david chapman he was a guy that shot lennon right and you know, that's the kind who's just completely nuts, who's completely nuts, but also completely committed to that act where, you know, he had that story where he was in Hawaii, flies to New York, doesn't doesn't want to do it, waits outside the Dakota, flies back to Hawaii, changes his mind, flies back a second time, waits outside the house all day. That that's the kind of thing that really worries me more is that you pick up one of these people that. You know, they they say, oh, you know, this guy, his tweets, his articles, his book, it felt like he was speaking to me and there was a secret code that I was able to unravel, you know, the helter skelter stuff. And that's where you take more implements of physical security, of surveillance, having those, you know, having security measures in your house. And look, just being, you know, for me as as a conservative and as a veteran, you know, we we practice the Second Amendment. You know, we do have that. God forbid that anything like that would ever come up. But, you know, we have taken those steps that we are able to defend ourselves should something happen. And so, you know, it's you do kind of have to, you know, sort of keep a, keep an eye out over your shoulder. But fortunately, one of the other nice things about where I live and one thing that I'm looking for is everybody where I live right now is either military currently serving or a veteran, uh, contractors, federal law enforcement, secret service, special agents, FBI, et cetera. So put it this way, uh, if you're not from around our neighborhood and you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, we got eyes on you. <laughs> well, good stuff. Uh, last thing I want to hit you with here, Jack, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? You can do it. You can do it. Just put in the time. You're going to screw up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make accidents, but you can do it. Biggest thing, mentality. Have a lifeguard mentality, right? That is your job. When the lifeguard is at the pool, what are they doing? They're out there taking care of everybody. They're thinking about what could go wrong. Doesn't mean you got to be a helicopter parent. Doesn't mean you got to be, oh, I've got to, you know, put styrofoam over every little thing in my house and I got to do this and that, right? But you want to be reasonable and you want to take those precautions. And as the kids get older and they start to learn to walk and they start to learn, you know, how to get into things and mess with it, just think ahead. Just think ahead. Have that lifeguard mentality, that lifeguard mindset of always being one or two steps ahead of something that could go wrong so that when it does, you can be there and be ready to prevent it. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. There's been a lot of fun for me. I got to say, Jack Basobic, you're a first-class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here at First Class Fatherhood. Thank you. Appreciate that. God bless.